Welcome to episode 81 of the Toadstool Boardroom for the week of March 6th, 2024. My name's Logan Plant, and I'm joined, as always, by Justin Corice. What's up, Logan? And to talk about his favorite topic in the world, emulation and other extra things, it's Chris Schreiber. It's a me. And unfortunately, uh, I was informed less than 60 seconds ago that a Princess Peach Showtime demo just dropped on the Nintendo Switch eShop. We're not going to have impressions on that because we have to record right now. So uh, maybe we'll have some time to talk about that next week. But this week, we still do have a lot of interesting things to talk about, like what's up with Mario Day this year? And we'll start right here with Nintendo shutting down Switch emulator Yuzu. Chris Shriver talks about Yuzu a lot on this program, so I'm sure he's going to have a lot of thoughts. I'm sure Justin will as well. Here is the quick facts about this. So Nintendo filed a lawsuit against Yuzu last week, and already, very quickly, they settled, and Yuzu is paying Nintendo $2.4 million in damages. And in its argument, Nintendo said that Yuzu is primarily designed to circumvent several layers of Switch encryption in order to make it possible to play Nintendo games on devices like Steam Deck, and Nintendo said that this is, I thought, the most shocking fact of the whole thing. Tears of the Kingdom was pirated over one million times before release, which is just crazy. And yeah, spoilers were out there. A ton of people were playing it the week before it came out, and the Yuzu emulator is the primary way that people were accessing it. Yuzu's Patreon earned about $30,000 a month, and this included adding special unreleased features to Nintendo games, so kind of think the second that they uh, started gating some of this emulation stuff behind a Patreon, that kind of uh, sealed the deal for Nintendo's legal case. Uh, and then Citra, the popular 3DS emulator, is also discontinued, which personally I think is the bigger bummer in all this, but we'll get into that. And then I put Yuzu in quotes here on our notes sheet, uh, shared a statement in its Discord, and this was most definitely not ghostwritten by Nintendo. It was. It was absolutely written by Nintendo. If you read that, it's like, thank you so much for your understanding for this decision. It's totally, it's Nintendo language all over it. It's really lengthy. I'm not going to read it here, but basically they just explained the, the reason of the shutdown. So that's basically all the facts of what happened in the last week. And Chris, I'm going to throw it to you first. What's your take on all of this? Um, I... When this originally started, I was like very um, it's been a bit of a roller coaster of emotions in, in terms of how it's been handled. Um, <clears throat> when this story originally broke, um, the court filings that did come out or, or the, there's like a 41 page legal document that came out uh, related to this. Um, and a lot of the wording was really centered around the fa- the idea that uh, Tears of the Kingdom had been pirated uh, over a million times prior to release. Um, and you know, the the things you talked about there, um, and my gut reaction was that's not the fault of Yuzu. That's the fault of Nintendo for having their game leak before, uh, it was released. Um, you know, like that's, that's not on the Yuzu team. The Yuzu team also didn't distribute that game. Um, the internet did. Yuzu was just a means to play that game. Um, and it, it kind of at the start seemed like the basis of this, um, like they didn't, I mean, Nintendo is always going to try to have a leg to stand on in, in the emulation conversation. Um, and it's always kind of a bit, um, I'll say two faced, um, because it's like, you know, you can, it's that forward conversation of like, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. Um, like you can emulate any Nintendo game you want as long as it's on Nintendo switch online. Um, or it's within you know our our playing field, um, and as it has gone on, and the specifics have come out, like following them, uh, basically Yuzu folding, right? Um, we've learned that the the crux of it, or what they really nailed them on, was the fact that um, you had the ability to decrypt their games using. Um, illegally obtained like prod copy keys. So for those who aren't familiar with, and I, I will try, I will try to not get too into this. Um, historically, um, anytime somebody has tried to, or like specifically Nintendo has tried to like knock down an emulator platform, um, they will do it on the basis that it is, uh, it contains intellectual uh, property. Um, in most cases, uh, at a software level. Um, generally around encryption, decryption, um, system bioses, 
Um, so like different different emulators are going to require different files in order to run um, different games. Uh, in Yuzu's case, uh, every Switch system has like its own encryption key uh, associated with it, and then that system decrypts uh, a game file to let you be able to play it. Um, so the way Yuzu worked was like you would, or you're, the way you're supposed to do it, so it was legal, quote unquote, was um, you would pull that key off of your switch. And then like that, you were the sole owner of that key. You're not supposed to distribute it. Um, and then that was what allowed you to run it on other platforms like PC and, and all that. Um, obviously, that, people distributed like to ensure that you have to own a switch to be able to do it. And that's right. Like that, okay. that was the legal backing. Um was it's like, well, this is my key. Like, you can't prove that it's not unless you come to my house and check my switch and, you know, you do all this, you know, fancy stuff. So um, that was always kind of the, the the protection that Yuzu had. Um, and then, obviously, those keys start getting distributed over the internet. You, you can pull them off from wherever. Um, and, and, you know, that's where uh, issues arise there. Um we saw a similar thing with uh, Dolphin was supposed to come to Steam and somebody pointed out in uh, their GitHub repo that there was a, a similar uh, file. It, I don't can't remember what the file name or anything, but um, basically that it was like, no, this is a Nintendo like written file. You can't just distribute this on the Internet uh, over the Steam marketplace. So that's where that got axed because Valve was like, we don't want to be in a legal battle. With Nintendo, if you guys are going to distribute this, um, so all that being said, um, where Yuzu I think messed up is they almost did. If you're familiar with Breaking Bad, they did the thing that like Walter White did, where like he got too big for his own britches. Like it was fine when you had an emulator, but then when you go out and you're soliciting people on Patreon and you're making thirty thousand dollars a month. Like you're asking to become a target at that point, um, as, as uh, unfortunate as it is, because you know the people that are part of this community, like they're investing their time, and I'm sure they want to see a return on that that time investment. Um, and quite honestly, like if you're, I know plenty of people, myself included, that like I bought Tears of the Kingdom day one. Um, I do not like the way that that game runs on Nintendo hardware, um, and Frankly, there are better means to play that game right now um, in Yuzu if you still have it. If, it. if it hasn't disappeared, you know, you haven't removed it from your computer at this point. Um, but Nintendo doesn't I, care about that. Nintendo, Nintendo doesn't, doesn't care, care about like that. It runs on Switch, yeah. Right, and and I think that's, that's the part of Nintendo that I can't stand um, because they have so many amazing pieces of software out there that are trapped on hardware that, like history has moved on like like things have gotten better and people have found ways to improve uh the means to play those games um and i think that's where a lot of people you know myself included really start to get upset about it and then there's the whole preservation conversation and all that but i won't get into that um like we could save that for the citra part of this um so all that to say um as of right now in me just poking around um <laughs> If you're familiar with MU Deck, you're a Steam Deck user. Uh, they posted about a half hour ago on Discord that they will be closing uh, the Yuzu support channels on their Discord server. Um, same with Citra. Um, as far as I'm aware, the Ryu Jinx is an alternative uh, Switch emulator. That has not been shut down. Their Discord community is locked at this point. Um, they're not accepting new members. So I imagine there's a couple ways this could shake out. I could see a lot of the people that were a part of the Yuzu project jumping ship over to Ryu Jinx. Um, I could also see a lot of people banding together and creating a new emulator. That's what generally tends to happen out of these projects. Um, this was such a huge story when it broke, especially in the absence of a new Switch or Nintendo console this year. Um, I think you're going to have a lot of people with a lot of time on their hands that uh, now have something to work towards. Like they, they have a common goal. And, you know, when you have an open source community um, working towards the same common goal, like they're probably going to get it done. Um, 
So we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, I think this definitely. Uh, I think people will be quiet for about six months or so. Like I don't know that they're going to go public and say, "Hey, we have a brand new Switch emulator next week," because they don't want to ruffle the feathers of Nintendo. But um, uh, this will. I don't think this will be the end of Switch emulation by any means. I mean, we 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 shouldn't see Dolphin running at this point if that were the case. Um, and that's a very popular and has been for like twenty years. Um, we and GameCube emulator and, and you know there, there's countless others for other consoles as well. Justin, what's your take on all this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's complicated. That that that's that's the big takeaway. I I think it's unfortunate that Nintendo has this track record of being so litigious uh, about things like this. They have every right to protect their intellectual poli- uh, uh, intellectual um property uh, and and like as a publicly traded company they have an obligation to do so so I, I also understand where it comes from but it's tough because they you know sell themselves as such a kind of family friendly like almost mom and pop and they they go after folks and they go after them hard and i i think that it's it, it kind of flies in the face of the image they try and portray but at the same time like as the holder of an intellectual property, like, you know, people talk a lot about the role of emulation and things like game preservation and things like that. And yeah, it has a role in that, but here's the simple truth. If you own the IP, you get to decide if it's preserved at all. It doesn't have to be preserved. And as the IP holder, if Nintendo wants to be bad about game preservation, that's the choice that they get to make just from a legal perspective. I don't like it. I hate it. I wish stuff was more widely available. I mean, I could do an entire show about game preservation and what I think should happen because I do think there, as as Art eventually, you do hit a point where you have some public responsibility too, but that's not the way it's looked at legally. Uh, and so that's an issue. Um, emulation in a vacuum is legal. But as this Yuzu case demonstrates, and something that I was uh, saying in private conversations leading up to this, emulators as they exist, frankly, are largely not uh, for reasons exactly like this. Like, what what of the, the main things that really um, basically had user dead in the water was the fact that uh, the way that it is used, what it is used for, specifically re- relies on uh, pirating those uh, the software encryption keys. Uh, and they were able to discover as, like, part of this investigation that, yeah, like, the vast majority of users, that's what they're doing. That's you effectively make the case that that's what this software is for and you're dead in the water. And on top of it, you know, once you enter any kind of legal process like this, you have what's called discovery. That's when you get to gather up evidence and conversations. And uh, to the shock of hopefully nobody, once they gathered, you know, Discord conversations, emails, private communications on this subject, yeah, as much as the the folks that were putting on a public face about this being just, no, this is just a, a very, like, this for, like, homebrew, Switch games, things like that, no, they were actually very, let's say, in, enthusiastic about uh, sharing software that you that um, you sh- you are not legally able to do so. I, I think it's I think it's disingenuous to say that um, there's not a significant overlap between emulation and piracy. That's lo- that's a very big part of what it's for. Um, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that emulation is bad and shouldn't exist. Again, I think from a game preservation standpoint, it should exist. I frankly would love to see it have actually some greater legal protections than it has. But as the laws exist now, if you do draw the attention of somebody extremely litigious like Nintendo, the odds are not very good of you making it through the other side, especially after the discovery process. Yeah, they, they pretty quickly waved the white flag in this one. We're like, okay, yeah, you got us. It's They kind of gave in to mm. the pressure that Nintendo applied pretty rapidly. And yeah, it's interesting because, Justin, you mentioned kind of the, the mom and pop persona that Nintendo likes to put on. And yeah, but then behind the scenes, their legal team does go after people very hard. Like they're very the most notorious easily in the industry for doing so. But I guess, yes, in a way that contradicts kind of this persona we talk about, but from another angle, I almost want to say it, it protects it in a way. Like Nintendo is very protective of their IP as they mm-hmm. kind of should be. It is some of the most valuable IP in the world. And there's a reason that Nintendo is doing so well when the rest of the industry is kind of collapsing around us right now. And a big reason of it is because of the strength of its IP. And so yeah. I, I think the case is a little bit different for me because this one is a, like Tears of the Kingdom. That game came out on Yuzu before it came out on Switch. And like you said, Chris, that's not Yuzu's fault. The game leaked and it got out there. 
But and yeah, a million times. But how many of those people also bought it? Probably a lot. We don't know those exact numbers. But uh, go ahead, Chris. And that's the one thing that I I would love. And there's no way to quantify this. But like the how many people that owned a PC or played games on a on a PC over the last seven years since Breath of the Wild came out fired up uh, Breath of the Wild on Simu ran it at 1080p or 4K60, and we're like, wow, this game is incredible. And then that got them to buy a Switch, and then that got them excited for Tears of the Kingdom. Like, there is a there is something to be said about the exposure uh, factor uh, with emulation when, you know, like, if it's more easily accessible, granted, you know, are there legalities that you have to question? Absolutely. Um, but, like, I have to imagine in the long run, in... in most cases um because like yuzu is not easy to set up like you can't just give that to any mom and pop and they could just fire it up on on whatever even getting it on the steam deck like you need to be able to find those keys um and you know and to the point of uh the tears of the kingdom leak like that only got ripped because um this the switch hardware itself got hacked like use again yuzu is not involved in that process at all like that's ripping a cartridge a pre-release cartridge onto a hacked piece of hardware and then uploading it to a computer and distributing it. Yeah, there's... And it got to the... I, I, so, and I, I do think that there's an important distinction to draw. Like, there there are, like, the like ethical, moral, moral arguments to be made about emulation and its role. And I think you're absolutely right. I think that there are ways that it can benefit products. It can benefit in, in ways that, like, you see cool videos, interesting things, and mods that people do. It can help give things an extended life. I think there's a lot of very good reasons to, frankly... Be more chill about this than uh, certain folks are, but the legalities, frankly, aren't as gray, uh, and and that's really what things like this run into. And and yeah, that actually circles back to what I was talking about nicely, which is that Nintendo is a business above all else, right? They are as much as we love talking about their characters and, and their products and their creators and all that. It is a business. And we've talked about on the show many times, Nintendo keeps a very pinpoint eye on the bottom line. And I guess that they've, they've decided, uh, Chris, you've talked about the exposure factor. They've probably weighed all of this internally and decided, no, it's just not worth it for their games to be out there like this, especially ones that they're still selling. I think things get a little bit slimier when you go and look at something like Citra, the 3DS emulator. They're not even selling 3DS games anymore. That is where it starts to bug me. I, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm just defending this trillion-dollar corporation. I get why they went after Yuzu for the Switch emulation 100%. 100%. I get why people are upset about it, too. Yeah. But saying, like, oh, wow, Nintendo's a terrible company because they did this. No, they, people are a million copies before Zelda came out. That's a $70 game. You know how much money they're probably thinking they lost over this? Like, no, it makes complete sense why they did it. The 3DS one's a bummer. It was kind of caught in the crossfire of this. And they shut down this shop last year. They're shutting down the online servers next month. Kind of to what Justin's been saying, it shouldn't be any of their business anymore, what people are doing with this stuff. They're not selling it. They're not making money on it. It's not part of their business anymore. They've moved on. But we haven't. And, and, And some people still want to play these 3DS games that... Physical copies are upwards of $300, $400, or they never got physical copies. And I think that is the the bigger bummer. And I'm not even speaking for myself. I don't emulate anything. You guys know that. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. But I just think it's a shame that the 3DS, one of my favorite systems, its preservation effort is being hugely diminished because of of this battle with the Switch emulator, which, again, I get. But it's a bummer for the 3DS side of things. Yeah, the, the and there is a, a Citra alternative that I know is an active development. I know it's not nearly as far along as Citra is or, or was, I should say. Um, but that is like th- there's a meme out there of like it is always uh, what is it? It is always morally correct to pirate Nintendo games or like there's nothing wrong with that or anything like that. Um, hmm. But uh, yeah, the, it, it to that exact point, like. There are people out there that own these consoles that, like, at some point, if somebody wanted to buy a Trade Prime Federation Force or something, some random 3DS game, or a Nintendo podcast decided, hey, Kid Icarus Uprising is actually a really good game <laughs> and everyone should play it, now it's like the barrier to entry is way greater. And that's just a shame. Um, 
You know, I I think that's where it starts to ruffle my feathers. Mm-hmm. Will a Switch emulator return? A hundred percent. Do I get why they did this? A hundred percent. Like, yeah. it, there are definitely people that took advantage of the system, um, and 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 that's crappy. Like, I have like a moral um, rule with myself where it's like I either own the game or they're not manufacturing copies anymore. Because quite frankly, like, I don't really care if I'm giving money to GameStop for a used copy of some game that's no longer in print. I'd rather give it directly to the developer. And if you're not giving me that option, then like all the conversation shifts at that point, I'm going to find some alternative means. That's always been my personal stance on it. Um, and I mean, God, how, I bought every first party Nintendo game like ever basically that I've ever wanted to play. Um, so uh, morally, I never really have a, a problem with it, but you know, there's, I'm, I'm definitely the exception for sure. I, yeah, I mean, ultimately I strongly believe that there, it would be good to see frankly more, uh, pressure placed on Nintendo to make their stuff more available and to, um, engage the community more in ways to help on the preservation side. Cause I, I think, I think that's ultimately what it comes down to is that like, yes, the, the law is absolutely on their side here, but there are, like people who love Nintendo who are getting left by the wayside when things like this happen. And it's unfortunate that, you know, their, their needs are largely being like ignored. Um, and, Cause like there's like, there's, there's also accessibility things you can do by, you know, modding things onto PC and ways that you can interface with them and control them and, and things like that. Like there's, like, there are a lot of benefits to it. And, and as, as much as the law is on the Nintendo side, I really think they, um, this is an area where they are underserving the community. I think that the financial side of it too needs to be brought up. We're all very lucky that if we want a new Nintendo game, we can buy it. Other people are not in that position and these games don't go on sale. Mm -hmm. They just don't. So you're, you're dealing with a situation where the games don't go on sale and the the alternative means to play them are being shut down. And I know that that's how business works. That's just unfortunately how it goes, but yeah, I think that that that's another angle of it too. Is that Tears of the Kingdom is going to be seventy dollars for five more years, and that that is a bummer for people that cannot afford that. That either need to buy it used, borrow it from a friend. Like uh, this was a way I'm sure a lot of people did access it that otherwise would not be able to. At some point, as an industry, we do need to start having a conversation about financial accessibility. Yeah, yeah, and Nintendo. Probably $60 forever. The, <laughs> I would make the argument of yeah. the worst offender. It'd, it'd be hard to, th- to think of anybody else who could compete with yeah. that. <laughs> and I get having your games remain valuable because they're still desirable and they're still good and they don't diminish their value by putting them on sale $40 off a month in. That is one of the reasons that they are so successful. But I think when we're talking about seven or eight year old games at this point, it's, it's a little gross to see mm. them still sitting at full price. Uh, on shelves i get even lasting a few years at full price i get that but like at the end they need to bring back nintendo selects or something like that which was their previous answer to this right that that was how they did it on 3ds and we and wii u was yeah this game's gonna be 60 dollars, but in the final year of the console's life we'll put it out for 20 we'll put it out for 30 maybe they do that this year because it's 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 time to see that Anyways, that is uh, Nintendo shutting down Switch emulator. Usually a lot of people were fired up. I don't know what you guys were going to think. I thought that uh, maybe Chris was going to roll in and, and flame Nintendo here, but he didn't. I was, I was surprised by that. Because a, a lot of big emulations. I mean, I couldn't. Games, you know, like, oh. you know I, I can totally take that road. Like, I I think if I didn't have faith in the emulation community, I, I would. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, there's also nothing pressing that I'm like dying to play on Yuzu right now. Like I, I tend to play everything on switch, but I like having the option. Um, if, if six months from now I was like, you know, I'm going to play tears of the kingdom from the beginning. Cause it's been so long. Um, I'd probably start on Yuzu if the option was available because I don't want to play that game at 26 frames. I just don't. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. ever comes out an upgrade <laughs> if it ever comes out a year from today march 6 2025 you heard it here first there you go no, that's just a guess that's just a joke that's 
it's just a joke. Okay, we got a follow-up question on the same topic about third-party consoles. And this one comes from Scott, who emailed toadstoolboardroom at gmail.com. And Scott writes, great show, guys. Thanks for the informative content. Here's a rough question maybe you can tackle. What's the deal with third-party consoles? Brands like Hyperkin and Analog are making consoles and handhelds that play Nintendo cartridges while seemingly not being sued into oblivion by Nintendo. But it seems unthinkable that someone would put out a third-party device that plays Switch games, right? What are the laws around this? Does a certain amount of years need to pass? When might we see a non-Nintendo system that plays GameCube or Wii games? Who wants to jump into this one first? I can if, if Justin... Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so... Um, in terms of any clone consoles that exist, generally there is an expiration date on any, um, and, and this is what I've read. Um, whether I'm not a lawyer, uh, I'll this say is not the toadstool courtroom. Let's make that clear. Yeah. No. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's our spin um, show coming, coming next year. <laughs> so, uh, my understanding of it is that there is like a, a shelf life on any of these, uh, given consoles. So like, Nintendo releases the Game Boy, and um, at some point they're going to stop distributing it. I mean, kind of like what we're talking about in the previous conversation. Um, at some point, that patent or that IP, uh, or not IP, but whatever it is that like is associated with that does expire. Um, so there's nothing stopping anybody from going out. And like Nintendo's not still actively selling Game Boy consoles that, um, out in the wild. So there's nothing preventing anybody from making a clone console that, that plays that as long as it does not modify the functionality of that console. Um, so, and that's like the big uh, dividing line from what I understand. So like if you build a Game Boy from scratch and its sole purpose is to play a Game Boy, play Game Boy games with a D-pad, a start and select button and an A and B button, like, and it, and it reads cartridges, you're technically not breaking the law. Um, even if it looks nicer, like the analog pockets do? Like even well, if- so... So that's a whole other... So I'll get there. So companies like Hyperkin, they release consoles. Um, they have clone consoles, and then like the Retron 5 is a really popular one. They actually got into some hot water when that console released um, because some of the people that opened up the source code of it realized that it was using uh, emulation software that had been distributed or built by other teams, basically, and they kind of stole it. Um, without any of the permission of uh, those developers. Um, my understanding is they've gone back and changed that and built their own emulator uh, for whatever consoles those were associated with. Um, my Retron 5 died a number of years ago, so I, I just stopped looking into it. Um, in terms of the analog, analog, their business model and the analog pocket, my understanding of how they circumvent that is they're based out of Australia, which has more, and, and because... Nintendo is Japan based. They have more of like a loose um, legal thing that they have to uh, fight. Um, on top of it, they're building basically the way that they sell that thing is this is to play the games that they specify you are to play on it. Um, so anything that goes into the Game Boy cartridge slot, anything that goes into any of their adapters like Atari Lynx, Game Gear, uh, Neo Geo, um, those are what you're supposed to play on it. And on their site, it explicitly states you are not to load games onto an SD card, play ROMs off of that, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody does that. Um, the way that they circumvent it is there's a operating system that uh, Analog developed called um, OpenFPGA, um, which basically gives people the ability to build software that acts like hardware. So they built software that pretends to be a Super Nintendo um, and then can run Super Nintendo games as long as the hardware is powerful enough. Um, Analog is not providing this. Use air quotes if you're audio listening. Um, But uh, that is how they circumvent that. Well, Justin, was a lot there. Add, or was that? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I think I think Chris Chris is spot on. The, the the big thing to keep in mind is something like the analog pocket is not using software based emulation, like something like Yuzu does. It's not using things that are defeating encryption or anything like that that can you know result in stolen code. What they've done is they've um, built a console that can run those things. And reverse engineering, which is a different thing, is simply legal. 
Like if if somebody builds a device and you and you legally acquire one and you take it apart, figure out how it works and how it operates, the information that you've gained from that is legally obtained and legally usable. You may run into certain like patent issues um, about like how things work, the intention of certain things, and like you know, the, believe it or not, the little like Nintendo D pad is patented, right? So you can, you know, so like there are things like that that you need to navigate, that you need to be careful about. But like, for example, you know, when VHS players were invented, other folks could reverse and engineer things that came out and figure out how to build their own. And, and again, and that is that is legal and healthy. And so that's really what they rely on more so than, uh, you know, uploading like and like the, the fact that they frankly don't aren't meant to run ROMs is like a big part of like why it, yeah. it works and why it makes sense. It's again, it's a it's a piece of hardware that was engineered for the task of operating those. And that's that's pretty different from emulation. Yeah, if if Black and Decker makes a toaster, right, and Hamilton Beach is like, wow, that's a nice thing. I'm gonna make a toaster. Mm -hmm. Like they can buy that toaster and take it apart and, and make their own. Like yeah. there's nothing stopping them. Exactly. From doing they that. they can't make that exact toaster, but they could learn a lot from it about how to use it to make bread into toast and then make their own <laughs> device based on that information. And that's really what they did. I'm always glad you guys are here, but especially this week, because I know nothing about any of this, and you guys did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> this is my, like, you know bread and butter. It, your toast and butter, too. This is my toast and butter. This is toast and butter. But you know what I do know about? I know about this guy named Mario, and March 10th is Mario Day, and Nintendo is, is doing a few minor things uh, to celebrate. Last year, they really went all out for Mario Day. They, like, debuted the last Mario movie trailer. They dropped the Mario Kart tracks on that day. Like, they did a lot of stuff. This year... A little quieter so far, but everybody's favorite or least favorite internet leaker is teasing that that might not be the case. So uh, this year, the things that Nintendo has already talked about is a Nintendo Switch Online 14-day free trial membership, which I thought was pretty cool. If you don't have Switch Online, you can try it out for two weeks. Uh, Super Mario World, if you play that on the Super Nintendo Switch Online app, you will get profile icons. So more limited time Mario stuff like we saw a few years ago. Uh, there's going to be a digital game sale, and LEGO is teasing a Mario-themed broadcast on march 9th i'm hoping that it's not just more of the kind of uh younger audience aim sets i'm hoping we get something like the bowser or like the mario nes and the tv i hope that we see what that is on this like a broadcast because that would be really cool and there's some other leaks floating out there too from that little penguin guy that we've mentioned on this show a few times so if you're interested in what uh might happen on mario day you can go check that out but i don't really want to tell you here so yeah that that might happen mario day what Lego set do you hope gets announced, Chris? You had to pick a Mario Ooh. set. I had to pick one? And Justin, too. God. This, this also yeah. to you. I mean, I, I would love to see some sets based on Super Mario RPG, but, you know, you know I'm a sicko for that. That'd be pretty good. Uh, what would you want? Pick a location. Ooh, if I had to pick a location, like, uh, um... I would love to see... Uh, Monstro Town. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. That'd be a fun set. Many figures of the Mario RPG characters would be pretty great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have two that come to mind, and they're both like real wacky, and and like they would never do it. Um, <laughs> just like let me build Flood, like just the whole backpack. Yeah, I was thinking Sunshine too. I was thinking Delta yeah. Square would be super cool. That'd be a fun that would be cool be if it was like a diorama one. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um. Oh, or uh, oh, sure, crap! Now I forgot it. It's okay. Probably wasn't that good. <laughs> you know, you know what? I, you know, I, I would like like to see on the subject of Lego. Um, and I, I don't think this is what, where we're getting, but like I would, I think this could be fun. Is um, you know, there there are Lego shorts out there, like short films. Like there's a great Frozen one that's really funny. I would love to see a Lego Mario short, like just a short like five to ten minute animated lego mario cartoon of some cute. sort that would be that i think that would be really fun and really cute yeah that'd be cool the animal crossing sets just came out last week that's another one they could easily do it with at some point but that's not justin's thing don't bring up animal crossing around him or he'll get real real mad. <laughs> T uh, so you know me mario always Day. raging yeah <laughs> always at animal crossing uh are you guys as annoyed by this Nintendo leaker and the like <laughs> fandom surrounding them as I am, or is that just, I think what, well, what has me annoyed right now is that I was like, Oh, like I had a thought 
that uh, maybe they'll announce this on Mario Day. And then two days later, he tweeted it. And I'm like, well, now my, I can't come on the show and say it because people are going to think I'm just copying because he knows things or she knows things. Yeah. Honestly, I'm glad, so we're not, I'm glad we're not talk, talking about it on the show because I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, well, I, I don't. Well, I personally think it's annoying, and I can get into why. Yeah. And again, this is not me defending a mega corporation. I, I think that it could come across like that. I just think it's all really ridiculous and unnecessary. So Nintendo doesn't say things until they're ready to say things, and then they say them, and then we get that information, right? That is how it works. And people are always really hungry and starving for the next information drop from Nintendo. So what do they do? They waste way too much time scouring the internet and picking these leak accounts to buy stock in to see who's right and who is wrong. And now this one, their name is what? Puro. It's the WarioWare penguin character. And they, they are right, right? They're not guessing. They know things. They see the videos ahead of time somehow. They, they, they know things. They have not been wrong yet. The only time that they were wrong, they said beforehand, Hey, I might be wrong about this. I just heard this like last year. I'm not sure. So they have they have not missed. They know stuff. So when that account tweets stuff, it's basically confirmed. And so now we're at a, and that account doesn't tweet stuff that's not true, and they don't tweet stuff until like two days before Nintendo does. So how is it any different than when we didn't have this account? tweeting everything or we're just sitting waiting for a different account to tweet instead of sitting waiting for a nintendo to tweet it is literally no different and i feel like people just don't have any patience like do you know how many games there are you could be playing right now instead of like waiting for nintendo to announce something so it's, it's just annoying and and people are like we love you so much puro you're so awesome thank you so much for everything you do for this community and i'm like I just don't. It's all unnecessary. I it's just think, all totally unnecessary. I mean, I, I, I think you could make the case that things like that um, rob people of an opportunity to be surprised and delighted, which is like one of my I favorite mean, things is like, yeah, I remember back in the E3 days when an unexpected announcement knocks your socks off and you get really excited about that. So like, you know, uh, ruining that stuff, I think, is is frankly a bit sad. Uh, and um, uh, on the flip side, like, and maybe it's because I'm just frankly not an ultra online guy i don't know what the leaks are i don't know what this guy's account was called i'm not gonna remember that five minutes from now so i'll be just fine yeah it's it's it's, it's, yeah. it's me. logan do you follow him or is it just because people that you're associated with do and therefore you see it yeah i just see it and, and, okay. and it's hard because i i strive to know everything there is to know about nintendo and that is stuff to know right now so i'm i'm really right. like torn on how to approach this because i don't like going and saying oh this is happening before Nintendo says it to us ourselves, because what's the benefit of that? I, I don't see the benefit of it. So I'm choosing to not talk about that stuff on this show because I think it's unnecessary. I know there's listeners who don't want to know it. Mm. And, and I agree. I think that the really cynical way to talk about a Nintendo Direct is, oh, it's just commercials. You're getting excited about commercials. And yeah, literally all, <laughs> everything in the game industry is just designed to get us to spend money. But I don't care. I know it's commercials. It doesn't mean they're not exciting. You're not excited for things that you're going to, like, hobbies that you spend money on? No, that's silly. So I've never liked that take, that we're getting excited for 40 minutes of commercials. I agree with what Justin said, that, like, the way they package it is cool and it's exciting. And they better catch this freaking person before they steal <laughs> the next console, before they come out and say, hey, Switch 2's called this and they're announcing it in two days. Because that would just suck. They're, they're, they're pulling their PI off the Yuzu case, going to put him on him now. And... <laughs> Honestly, what are the chances that like that that is somehow related to them pushing, pushing the it? console? Yeah, I, I, you've got to wonder if that's that's somehow a little bit. Related. It's actually just Doug Bowser. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, you won't believe what I heard in this meeting. <laughs> it's Reggie. They didn't take away his right. Slack access. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like the he's just lurking in a in a uh, room yeah. that he shouldn't be in. Yeah, but I, I know it, it's just it's just stupid and. Mm -hmm. So after this account got that one thing wrong, it was about Pokemon, everyone was like, oh, it's okay, we still love you. And I'm like, what does anybody gain from yeah. literally any of this? This is an anonymous user. Maybe they're some like scorned employee that's unhappy working at Nintendo and this is how they're getting back. That's the only reason that I can see that they benefit at all from this. Because they're getting all this internet clout, but nobody knows who they are, so what's even the point of it? Like, It's, it's stupid. It, it fires me up, and I hate it. I hate it a lot. So, yep. There's uh, some things that may happen later this week. 
Okay, let's talk about something that gets me less fired up, which is Nintendo Switch's seventh anniversary. Yeah, so this this passed over the weekend, March third, twenty seventeen, and lot, lots of people were sharing kind of their launch day stories for what when they got their Switch, what they were doing, what they remember about it. And I don't think we've done that on this show yet, so I figured that maybe this is the last Switch anniversary before the next one. I'm sure that Twitter account will tell us. Uh, so let's share our own Nintendo Switch launch day stories. Justin, did you get your Switch on launch day? If I did not, not, when did you get it? And what do you remember about it? Yeah, I did not. And uh, I'm actually quite proud of how I managed to get my Nintendo Switch because it was complicated. It was like, okay. as, as folks hopefully recall, they were impossible to get. And this is like the popular Nintendo consoles tend to be. And so um, I was not able to, to like, secure in advance one of the launch ones and so it was going to be a question of like i'm gonna have to finagle find a way weasel my way in somehow and so you know so seven years ago i used to uh, i was actually doing a football podcast um i that's how i got started podcasting i loved it i'm a huge football fan and so we uh we did this football podcast called next fan up and kind of the conceit of it was it was run by a gentleman who used to run all the podcasts for ESPN, basically. Uh, and the conceit was that there was one person whose job was to cover each team in the NFL. And so, like, they would um, have all the details on it. I'm a big Seahawks guy. And so I covered the Seahawks. And um, when, the, and so, like, we all got to know each other. We all became really close, scattered literally across the world because uh, we had people, like, international and things like that. It was really cool. And um, so I was looking everywhere. I was on all the websites. I think this is, like, before Discord... Uh, uh, it was like a big thing, and so like um, trying to find. How long is this after the switch came out? Like, what what timeline are we at here when you're doing all this? weeks? Okay, like like like, like very May. like very much launch window, like like yeah. uh uh, and so I'm trying to track that, and it's impossible. Like when things get restocked, they're gone instantaneously. Um, I have like my credit card information and every shopping website imaginable. No luck, and then finally I I get one of those tips. That says it's available, but uh, uh, and not sold out, but it's only via Amazon Prime now, which is two-hour delivery in San Diego, California. Uh, and so, like, I'm in Seattle at the time, so I'm like, okay, I can make this work. So I call up my the the friend from the show who reps the San Diego Chargers, and I'm like, and his name is Ken. I'm like, hey, uh, hey, Ken, uh, you're in San Diego, right? He's like, yeah. If I have something shipped to you, could you then mail it to me? He's like, yeah. Uh, so he gives me his address. It's at his door two hours later. He packages that thing up, sends it up to me in uh, Seattle. And I had my switch like three or four days later. It was a whole like, like that thing had been all the way up and down the entire like West Coast. But I got it. And, I, uh, and so I was, you know, in Zelda early and doing all that stuff. That's awesome. So did you uh, play Breath of the Wild on Wii U, or did you hold out until the Switch got to you? Switch. Purely Switch, 100%. Nice. Awesome. Sweet. That's cool. That's, it's good to have those podcast connections. That's mm -hmm. so much. Nice. How about you, Chris? Launch day or not, and what do you remember? I, was, uh, I got it launch day. I got 1-2 uh, Switch and Super Bomberman R along with Breath of the Wild. Um, one for three. Yeah, and snipper clips. I, I did pick that up. That was. Uh, I, I think I got everything on the everything with Just Dance because I think that was also a, a launch day game. Um, I actually got a gray set, like a dra gray Joy-Con set, which I actually no longer have. Um, I, I well, I did the palette swap for uh, um, uh, Atomic Purple, with the D pad. Always extra. Yeah, always extra. Never wrong. <laughs> um, but I remember uh, I had to work late that day and which was rare at the time like we had a, a big upgrade for one of our systems and um but i made a deal with my boss where i was like look best buy opens at 10 o'clock i have a pre-order uh it's 10 minutes away from the office i'm going to go in and get all of my stuff and then i'll be in work at like 10 30 and he was like no problem so <clears throat> i did that packaged everything up went to work uh, kicked off the upgrade, and me and my two bosses were standing in our office at like six o'clock at night playing one two switch. Like, oh, you can feel the marbles, like going back and forth. <laughs> <and> everything. <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah, I remember that. And then that whole weekend, it was it was that album, or I'm sorry, it was that uh, console and and Breath of the Wild and all that, and being like, oh my god, it's the Vita two, it's amazing, um, and. Uh, Ed Sheeran's Divide, 
album came out that same weekend. And it was like just listening to that if I was in the car and playing Breath of the Wild. And it was amazing. I uh, I was in college when the Switch came out. And I remember that I was waiting for it to ship to my dorm. And uh, it was I was stressed about it because they had like that you had to go and, and pick it up at the mail desk. And they had really weird hours. And then they had to go and search the back to see if they actually had your package back there. So I was like kind of anxiously waiting to get the text update. We had kind of a weird address too for our, our dorm building. So uh, I came out of one class and I didn't have the text yet. And I only had one more class to go and it was a 90 minute lecture. It was a gauntlet. I hated that class. And I was on the fence all day about skipping it. I'm like, um, the switch isn't in yet. So I'll just go, I'll go to that class. I won't, I won't cut. And the second the lecture started, I got the text that said we have a package for you waiting for you to pick up. And I was like, Oh my God, but I couldn't sneak out of class. So I remember that lecture being just the longest one ever waiting to go pick up the switch and breath of the wild. And yeah, I went and grabbed it and I got the breath of the wild collector's edition, not the one with the statue, but the one, the, the one level below that, that came, I think with everything, but the statue and my dorm had kind of a main common area and it had a, probably 65 inch TV in that common area. And I just commandeered it for probably the next two weeks. And I, I set up my switch in there and I was in there and, and these, these people who were like pledging frats would come in on their way out the door, like on Friday, that first Friday night heading out to Greek row or whatever. And they would stand and be like, Oh, is this a new switch? And they would sit and actually watch me for a second. And then they'd be like, Oh, cool. And, and I remember my roommate leaving to go to a party that night and I was so absorbed in Zelda that he walked out the door and he got back and I felt like no time had passed. <laughs> he was like, dude, I was just gone for four hours and it was like 2 a.m. And I was like, wow, that was just the the magic of that first day of Breath of the Wild. So, yeah, that was an awesome day. Awesome day. I was supposed to call some baseball on the radio for my uh, college radio club the next day and I remember backing out of that and I think that was uh, so I could just keep playing Zelda and I, I think that was the moment that I fully shifted from I'm going to be a baseball broadcaster to now I'm going to talk about Nintendo for, nice. for a living I think that was the official swap over to that point so yeah good times good times Nintendo Switch anniversary if you have a fun story email us toadstoolboardroom at gmail.com because we want yours also uh, also i also want to ask before we move on to our questions here where does nintendo switch personally rank for you at this point among the nintendo consoles chris i'll go to you first wow um not ready for I feel it like it it's in the top three for sure with, i mean if you look at if you look at the with the gamecube uh-huh. and the super nintendo i thought so yeah, um, like I'm very nostalgic for the GameCube, but if I go back and play those games, I'm like, Switch games are better. Yeah. Super Nintendo, it's it might be one. Switch might be one, honestly. Like if you think Can about us that, ranking the top, no, I mean if you think about the top Nintendo games that we we ranked on this show, the three of us, like the majority of them were on the Switch, and and. Part of it, you know, to Justin's point, when we did that, could have been recency bias. But the other part is like they've gotten really good at making video games. <laughs> I stand by that list. I really don't think that there's there's recency bias. Like I remember Splatoon three was one on there that that, that Justin and maybe some others were like, oh, does that belong? And going back to it for the DLC recently, I'm like, yeah, this is one of the best games they've ever. It's made. real good. This game is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so top three for sure, maybe number one. That's Chris's answer. How about you, Justin? Number two. Firmly number two. Um, Super Nintendo? Yeah, uh, Super Nintendo's number one, and frankly, it would take something incredible to uh, unseat that. I will say, um, the GameCube gives it a run for its money, but simply the size of the GameCube library is really what uh, keeps it down. Um, There just wasn't nearly as much software as I wish there was on it, and that's a shame because that console ruled. Yeah, it's it's firmly number one for me, and it's not even really close at this point. Like, I adore the GameCube. I love it. I love it to bits, uh, and that would probably be next up for me. And I have my my soft spot for the Wii U, but I wouldn't put it number one. Uh, and I, I love the the handhelds too. Like, I think the 3DS has an awesome library, but no, it's it's Switch. I feel like 
and we've talked about it before, like your experience with, with Nintendo in your lifetime is so vastly different than mine and Justin's. Yep. And like, I mean, like, like Justin's seen more than I have, like in his, his like youth. I get it. I'm um, old. It's fine. No, but no, but like you, you grew up like with the Super Nintendo. I got the hand me down Super Nintendo. Like you were getting things as they were coming out. Yep. Yeah. You had to, yeah. Logan had to live through some dark times. He did. <laughs> I did some, some lean days. I did, yeah. I grew up playing N sixty four. That's the first one I remember playing a, a ton of. And then GameCube was really the console of my childhood. For sure, it was the yeah. GameCube. But then, yeah, as I was like starting to become like a young adult, it was Wii U, and that was it. And then Switch. It was like I remember that year of college I talked about before Switch came out. I wasn't playing any games. I was granted. I, I just started going to college. There was a lot of other things occupying my time at the time. But then Switch just came out, and it like just reawakened that that Nintendo fandom that had been gone for like the last year or so. And that 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 just amazing Nintendo year of 2016. Just software all over the place. Just, what a wonderful year. Uh, no, it was terrible. There was nothing. There was Paper Mario Color Splash, and that's it. Uh, so yes. Yeah, and I just look at my favorite franchises, and I'm like, yeah, it's my favorite version of all of them is on Switch. Zelda, Mario, Smash Brothers, Mario Kart, Splatoon, all of them. The best one is there on Switch. So, yeah, it's hands down the best. And then uh, I'm, I'm a little worried. How are they going to follow some of these things up? Because I look at PlayStation 4, which had a pretty fantastic library, and I look at how they've struggled to follow that up. And it's sequels where it's like, yep, this is pretty much the same as the last one, but not as good. And... Uh, but I trust Nintendo. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think that they'll they'll take some things in some new directions, and, and we'll see how it goes on the next gen. But this gen has been pretty awesome, which we didn't really expect going into it. We were all pretty worried at the time. I don't know if you remember, but people were not feeling good about Nintendo Switch before it came out. And then the momentum kind of started to shift with that January event and that big Zelda trailer and the reveal of Odyssey and all that. And then, yeah, off to the races once... It came out and people were amazed. Oh, wow. It actually does switch in the dock as fast as it looks like in the commercial. It actually does that. Like, I think that was, I remember the first time I tested that out, that was the moment I knew, okay, this thing's going to work and it's probably going to be pretty successful. And it was to the point where now we're having to go through an eighth year of it when a lot of people are ready. To <laughs> it's move. too good. Yeah, it's too good. Too good too for its good. own good. But let's let's move on to our last topic of the show, which is EGAD's emails. You can always email the show, toadstoolboardroom at gmail.com. So uh, this first one comes from Tim, who says, Loved the show last week. The discussion around introducing kids to gaming was a massive highlight. It's a highly relevant topic for the stage of life I'm in, but one I don't really hear podcasts or shows talking about. Thanks for diving into that. Your question for this week took me a while. I feel like Nintendo... This is the question about what game should get a three-part remake. Uh, I feel like Nintendo is so intentional with the parameters they set for how they want the player to experience their titles. The idea of taking a game and stretching it into three with different gameplay elements is tough to imagine. At the risk of overstating this title on the show, though, impossible, Tim. It's impossible. I feel like the best candidate is Kid Icarus Uprising. I won't go into specifics with plot points to avoid spoilers, but the potential is definitely there to extend the story surrounding characters like Dark Pit, Veridi, or other bosses you come across. The way they discuss morality, especially later on in the game, is also incredibly unique for a Nintendo title and could also allow for meaningful decision-making to enter the mix as well. The levels themselves have some space to open up without compromising the core experience and may even allow the different weapon types to show off what makes them unique definitely won't happen but it could yeah that'd be an awesome pick i know that's one i just want a straight remake of though because i think more people need to see how good the original is like we've talked about every single week on this show either you guys started uh rebirth yet to go a little nintendo on on this podcast (laughs) wifey's been playing it i've been playing remake okay what what's she think of it so far chris uh she she's enjoying it a lot um i think she's doing too many side quests Quite honestly, between you and me. Um, but no, she's, I mean, she's probably 20, 25 hours in, if I had to guess. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm playing it. I like it a lot. Remake's one of my favorite games of all time. I think what they did with the story in that game is one of the coolest things I've ever seen in a video game. It, it blew me away, and I adore it. Rebirth, not hitting those highs for me so far, because so much of it is focused on, let's just be a fun party romping around the world and doing side stuff, which is not my kind of game at all. If you've listened to the show, you know that. Not my kind of thing. Did you play Final Fantasy VII, like the original? Yes, I've played it. Not at the time. Okay. I played it because of Remake. Yeah. Oh, okay. I played it before Remake came out uh, with like all the, 
the limit breaks turned on and double speed. Oh uh, yeah, all the cheats like, that you can yeah, 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 yeah. ripped through it to see the story, which is very important to play remake. Yep. So yeah, yeah. But I, I'm I'm just like being back in that world though. It's a gorgeous game. Also, one of the only games I've ever picked uh, performance mode over, or sorry, graphics mode over performance mode because it does not look good. Performance, performance mode looks real bad on that yeah. game. Um, it like it, if you get way too close, and uh, remake was this way too. Like remember the door in Cloud's apartment before oh, they patched yeah. it? It was just like a, a gray tile. Um, there's a lot of that in uh, in Rebirth, from what I've seen at least. Um, and it, it's like apparently it's a UE4 problem, but um, I hope they fix it later on. I hope they fix it by the time I play it, like five years from now. That'd be cool. It'll be on PC. Between now yeah. and then, you'll, you'll be steam decking it up with that one. That's right. This next one comes from Christian, who says, With what's looking like a potentially dry year as far as new video game releases, what are some games on your backlog that you would like to get caught up on this year? For me, I want to pass Sea of Stars, Shining Force on the Game Gear, and Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. Radiant Dawn, nice. Yeah, shout out. Shout out, Justin. So, uh, you guys got any picks? I actually have a playlist on the handy tool known as IGN Playlist. Uh, where I made a list of all the games that I hope to beat this year. So I'm pulling that up. Justin, any games you want to beat this year? Yeah, a lot of games. Uh, the the big one for me is uh, I've started when I have time to play, which is not much right now. Well, I should say, when I have time to play recreationally. Um, Persona 3 Reload, um, I'm really enjoying so far, but I'm still relatively early in. Um, you know, I I was I became acquainted with the series with, with uh, Persona 4, uh, and so I played four and five, but never three. Uh, and I've heard so many good things about three that I'm really excited about doing that. On the topic of Final Fantasy, I never finished remake. I'd like to finish remake and get into Rebirth because I do like the things that I hear about what it does um, with how it handles its narrative. Like it. <laughs> um, outside of that, um, I st- I still want to finish Xenoblade Chronicles three. Um, frankly, in terms of an ambitious scope and challenging. Uh, preconceived notions of connecting stories together. I think that it's actually shares a lot of DNA with what Final Fantasy VII is doing. Um, and I like that, and I like the grand ambitions of that. So, yeah, the the only thing I have in my backlog is these enormous RPGs that are going to take hundreds of hours. So, wish me luck. Yeah, I got it. That Xenoblade 3 is actually one that is on my list, too. It's one that I really want to get back to. I have, yeah. like, 40 or 50 hours in it. I think it's just awesome. So you're almost through the intro. Yeah, I know. Oh my gosh. Not even big games. Yeah, but it's great. I love the characters. I I love the music. The combat is clicking with me more than it has in the past in Xenoblade. Mm. So that's one that's on my list. Uh, Also, probably the biggest one on my list is Jedi Survivor. I talked about Mm. that game on our little secret bonus episode last year, but I really like what I've played so far. But Tears of the Kingdom just was the story of my 2023. I played that game for 180 hours across seven months, and everything else got pushed by the wayside. So I got to get back into Star Wars, which I really like what I've seen of it so far. Uh, and then anything else? Big? Baldur's Gate 3 oh, also. This is... That's what I need to finish. Oh, yeah, me too. I'm, a, I'm in Act 3 of that. Uh, and I was playing with a friend, but Helldivers has just taken over. <laughs> Um, or whenever we have time to play games together. So, yeah, Helldivers is, is so good. And this is the year I'm finally going to play Nier Automata. I'm going to play it. Oh, I what a great game. I, I played that for the first time reviewing the Switch version um, a couple years ago for, I want to say, Tom's Guide. Um, I hadn't played it before, and holy smokes, it knocked my socks off. What a great game, and the Switch version is complete and incredible. That's where I'm going to play it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it sounds like very much a Logan game from everybody I hear talking yeah. about. Yeah, so, and it, it lends itself out. really well to like the pick up and play nature of the Switch of like switching between the big screen oh. and being able to just like do kind of your busy work. Sweet, that's that sounds perfect. How about you, Chris? Any picks? Funny enough, like I never played a lot of uh, JRPGs growing up, and like for some reason that's all I've really wanted to do over the past couple months. Um, so uh, Sea of Stars is one that's like been on my radar. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get to play it. Um, every year I say I'm going to play Chrono Trigger. <laughs> Again, I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, Ori in the Blind Forest is one that has been uh, like on my oh, what a on my mind for a while. I know. I've been waiting for like um, the Metroidvania itch to hit, and I feel like I'm close. Um, 
And I know a lot of people would probably be like, just play Prince of Persia. But I like, I don't just, have that I, was, game, I held so. myself back from saying it. I was just, I knew, but I, I figured you were going to break it. <laughs> I watched yeah. your head like, Ugh! like that's everyone's first reaction. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll probably uh, dip into Ori. Um, play that on the Steam Deck. I do want to finish Final Fantasy VII Remake. I'm, I'm actively playing that now. I'm really into it. Really, really enjoying my time with it. Um, and I picked up Immortals of Avium. Um, it was an EA single player game, mm-hmm. like a single player first oh, person shooter. On the studio already, yeah. Yeah, um, but it looked like a cool game. Um, so it was on sale a couple weeks ago. I picked that up. Um, so I'll probably play that on a uh, on PC. And see what that's about. Um, it just seemed very different than uh, a lot of other stuff uh, that was uh, coming out last year. Um, it reminded me there was a, a VR game made by uh, I think it was Insomniac. That was kind of similar. It was like a first person like spell casting type of game. Um, just seemed kind of cool. Um, so yeah, those are the <coughs> probably the biggest ones, at least at the front of my mind. Pikmin four. Um, I've been uh, playing a little bit too as well. Um, just Dandori battles there, but like the more I do it, the more I'm like, do I get back into this? Like that game's you know my bread and butter. But you toast. Also, this is. This is no, no shade at Christian's question because yeah, everybody's talking about it being a dry year for video games. I don't know if I agree. Like, I think the last year was so nonstop that it's made this year feel like it. But I look at what's already come out this year and it's like we had Yakuza and Persona and Final Fantasy and Tekken and Prince of Persia and Nintendo's releasing some games to some middling review scores so far. But they've had a game every month so far. Next month we, or this month we have Dragon's Dogma and oh man, I'm blanking on the title of that team ninja one that's coming out. Uh, Rise of the oh, Ronin. Oh, the, the last Ronin. The, the Rise of the Ronin. Ronin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we have some Xbox stuff, like Hellblade 2 is finally coming out. Like, it's, There's actually kind of more than I feel like people are, are given credit. It's not bad. Year. Yeah. It's not. I feel like a lot of it is like people are expecting some... I mean, I think a lot of it is Sony, quite honestly. Like, big yeah. first-party Sony games. Like, you're not seeing that. I think that's fine. I think we have a lot of them right now. Um, I have a lot of other stuff to play, I should say. Um, yeah, it's it's not fine if you're a Sony aficionado, uh, but just as a yeah. but if you're a more like play anywhere gamer, yeah, it's not a bad year. And I do I, I do think there there is a a gap of like a certain amount of like marquee titles, but that's what gives things like Helldivers room to breathe. So frankly, Helldivers I think wouldn't it, have popped off like this last year. It would have came and went like everything else did. And I it think is it awesome. Yeah, deserves. It. I think it's good when there is some room for titles like that to breathe and get some attention. No, I, I completely agree. Like when, I, I think that my game of the year list this year is going to look very different than it's looked like in years past, where Zelda wins my favorite game of the year or some other Nintendo game wins. Yeah. I don't know, know if I expected a Nintendo game to be in the top five this year of my favorite games, and that's exciting to me. It's going to be things yeah. like Prince of Persia, which blew me away, or Helldivers, which does not seem like my type of game, but totally is, and I like that. And we should play I think more. that. That, yeah, we absolutely should. I think that that's kind of what I need this year because last year was so much Zelda, and I was like, gosh, nothing is calling to me anymore since I beat Zelda, and now stuff finally is starting to again because I'm playing different stuff this year. And mm-hmm. Some like palette that just go a long way. Totally. Absolutely. Sorry, Chris, you were going to say something. I think there's something to be said about like the single A and double A space um, and, and, and just enjoying games in there. Like if I look back at previous console generations, like some of my favorite games on, on you know, the Xbox 360 and, and, you know, Xbox era and all that, like they're from studios that are not first party. There are these like yeah. these games that, you know, maybe my friends and I picked up at GameStop because they were 20 bucks and, you know, we wanted to see what happened. And then it was like, wow, the saboteur is really good. You know, some like really random title from back then. Um, you know, I want to be able to continue to have those moments. Um, you know, when I look back five, 10 years from now at what we played in 2024, um, you know, what are those games going to be? Like, I kind of hope immortals of avium is that where it's like, yo, here's this sleeper game that nobody touched. Um, that I think is awesome. Like I love moments like that. It came out in the busiest year uh, known to video games ever. So, yeah, I think yep. that you should. If there's something, if you think it's a dry year, to try something new this year. Try something new. Try an indie. Try Prince of Persia. Try something. Try Hell Divers. Like yeah, because there's a lot of cool stuff that is coming out. I'm excited about Dragon's Dogma. I think that, that that's looking. That's like gonna be huge. Cool one. Yeah. Yeah. 
Looks like it could fill scratch the Monster Hunter itch while we wait for Wilds next year. That's kind of what I'm hoping for. Even though a single player kind of gives that vibe for me. Coming from Capcom. And last question here uh, before I let these guys get out of here. This one comes from Blee who says, If the rumors are true and Switch 2 was actually planned for release this fall, but now has moved to spring of next year, do you think we'll see another timed collection released for the Switch this holiday? A la Super Mario 3D All-Stars. I think it's impossible to predict if they'll ever do something timed again because it was so weird that they even did that the first time. So I don't know if they're going to do that again, but I will say it again. It's Zelda this fall. It's Twilight Princess. It's Wind Waker. I feel it. I, I think it's real. How about you guys, Justin? Uh, boy, I love being wrong about that one every year. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I. There is a big question about their fall, um, and they're in such such an interesting transition. Again, everything that we've heard indicates that they were preparing for a, a fall launch, and that has been pushed. Uh, and you know, there's there's enough credible and quality reporting on that that i'm pretty comfortable just sort of operating off that assumption so they will need something to to sell during the holiday season and a collection is a great choice for it so without any specific foresight i'm gonna say yeah i think there will be something i don't know what um i think that there's a lot of options that they could pull from i think that they may try to navigate uh of saving stuff that they could have for a collection later down the line um, and release something maybe a little bit more modest in scope than like a Zelda collection. But I would love to see, you know, your Wind Waker Twilight Princess pairing or something like that. But um, I, I, yeah, if I had to go out on a limb, I would say there's going to be something. There's got to be someone at Nintendo that it bugs as much as it bugs me <laughs> that they're the only two 3D Zeldas you can't play on Switch. They're the only two ones of the entire series. There's got to be somebody. And yeah, I, I think that, Justin, you, you joked being wrong about it every year. I'm not someone who sat here every year and says it's going to happen. But I do think it's going to happen this year. I, I do. I think that I remember the development time on Wind Waker HD was six months. Like, they got six months between now and September, so. Get them going for Nintendo Switch. And let's Fire up the factories. Yep. All of them. All, I don't know how many they have. All three of them. I'd like to see it. How about you, Chris? What do you think we're seeing this fall? So I do think that uh, the Zelda collection is going to happen. Um, I feel like that was all but confirmed, and now they're just holding it the way they did Metroid. But sitting here just now, I started giggling to myself, thinking, what if they really... What if they re-release Star Fox Guard and Star Fox oh, Zero, Star Fox Zero. <laughs> and they and they don't fix the controls the Star and Fox it's still collection. terrible to play? And like oh, you have oh. to use the gyro and everyone still ends up hating that game because they're like, no, everyone wants gyro. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I could see them doing. Yikes. That's one of the last I'm remaining in. Wii U games that hasn't made it over. Yeah. Yeah, also I'm NES Remix. That's true. Oh my gosh. Bring those over. Those games I was playing that the other day. It's still it's pretty darn good. It's so good. It's an awesome concept. I can't believe that they didn't go farther with it. And that Where's they my SNES remix? I know, right? Yeah, that would be so cool. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to hear uh, what's going to happen this fall. but uh, It'll probably be a couple months before we actually kind of get a clearer picture. But for now, that's another episode of Toadstool Boardroom in the Books, where a weekly Nintendo show here on Thursdays at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, video version on YouTube, and audio wherever else you like to listen to your shows. You can find the show on Twitter at ToadstoolBR. Send us an email, ToadstoolBoardroom at gmail.com. Justin, what are you playing and where can people find you? So by the time you uh, uh, watch or listen to this show, you should hopefully be able to see my final review of Nightingale up on IGN.com. Uh, uh, I put a lot of time into that game, so I, I, I hope uh, folks are interested to see what I have to say about it. Um, I've also been continuing to work on some guides for Helldivers. I just had a maybe my favorite guide video I've ever made come out uh, about the hug meta in Helldivers 2. And then um, starting sometime next week, I'm going to be working on the next project, which is a little baseball game uh, that comes oh, to a lot of consoles, awesome. including the Nintendo Switch. So um, I'll be moving on to that one for the next project. Gee, some people are sure freaking out about something dumb in that game, huh? Mm -hmm. And man, uh, uh, it, it is the same people who freaked out about something that was amazing in last year's, so I think we see where the problem Looking is. Looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, how about you? What are you playing and where can people find you? You're playing Final Fantasy VII Remake. I'm playing Final Fantasy VII Remake, baby. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Shrives93. Uh, one thing I do want to give a shout out to 
um, is our Discord community. First of all, uh, oh, they've been thank so you guys. Awesome. We have like a dude. There's like 50 people in our Discord. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Um, it's really incredible. So thank you to everybody who's been in there. Um, you know the the usual suspects uh, that have, have been uh, showing up every day and and just chatting and dropping memes and um, it it really has been. Uh, Codicius and, and Red Tea House, like Squid Kel, like you guys are, uh, you, you make my day every single time you're dropping messages in there. So I do appreciate it. Um, the other thing I did want to mention is um, Logan and uh, Justin and I were trying to f- determine what day is going to work best for a game night. Um, I don't know that I have the availability, or any of us really do, uh, during a weekend to do a 3ds game night so um if you guys want kick off a little conversation in the game night channel we will try to coordinate something there if we can figure it out maybe even if it's amongst the community members you know we can try and get that going as well um we do want to plan to do something in april as well uh probably on switch um because 3ds will be dead at that point (laughs) so if there are any games that you are itching to play on the switch uh in april uh you know we can kick off that conversation as well and uh, we can get some dates uh, thrown out there. We can try and see what works for everybody. 3DS servers shut down on April 8th. So I will play Kid Icarus again before then. Uh, so yeah, if, if you all figure something out, I will I will try and move heaven and earth to be there because I need to play that with you guys all again. So yeah, we'll figure it out. But I think for a more formal game night, like the next scheduled one we'll talk about here, uh, we'll do that sometime in April. Probably Mario Kart. We should play Mario Kart 8. Who doesn't? 50% of Switch owners yeah. play Mario Kart 8. So yeah, we should. Uh, and where can people find you, Chris? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Shrives93. You can find me online at Logan J. Plant, and I have been playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, but right after this, I'm going to go download uh, the Princess Peach Showtime demo and play that, and we'll talk about that on next week's show. Uh, hopefully you play it too, and let us know what you think, because this has been a big mystery to all of us for a while, so I'm excited to see how it actually plays. But until then, have a great week, and we'll catch you next time right here in the Toadstool Boardroom. <laughs>